Now, out of the two errors, the main problem for Western society today is undoubtedly license. As we covered in section one of this series, people have thrown away the reference point on their moral compass and are following Satan in his do-what-you-want philosophy. It's destroying us, it's leading to poverty, disease and bondage for society. We all see the decline, even non-Christians notice something has gone wrong. But while they have no clue about the solution and are hopelessly lost in their sin, Jesus has revealed himself as the cure to their heart sickness and says to his followers, go into all the world and preach the good news. In other words, tell them about me. Christians have been charged with the responsibility of taking his message of freedom into the world, healing the sick and casting out demons as we go. The question that faces us today is, what will we do with that command? Will we obey? And if so, how? How will we reach the lost, change hearts and reform society? The traditional approach towards evangelism for the church has been the Pharisaic approach, to attempt to cure a licentious society with legalism. In the past, the church basically went to the world presenting Christianity as nothing more than a list of heavy forbidding rules saying, Hey world, become a Christian and you'll never get to drink alcohol again, watch TV, listen to music or play sport on a Sunday. Instead, you can give up your Sunday morning lie in to come to church where people will squabble pointlessly about jeans, suits, hats, flowers, drums and Bible translations. Come to the place where people gossip about one another behind their backs because someone was seen lifting up their hands in church in what can only be considered an overly enthusiastic show of emotion. Come to the place where people are proud, arbitrary, hard-hearted, hypocritical critical and will turn their back on you because you're not perfect. And of course, when non-Christians see Christianity presented in that way, they are rightly repelled for the same reasons that we're repelled by the Pharisees. There is nothing attractive about it. It is cold, lifeless, loveless religion, and Jesus hates it more than anyone. In fact, Christians become a barrier to Christ when we adopt a Pharisaic mindset like that. Because of the ineffectiveness of that legalistic approach, Christians then changed tack and invented what became known as seeker-sensitive evangelism. This started to come to the fore about the 1970s. The thinking behind this approach was that the best way to reach a world lost in licentious living was to join them in it. We must immerse ourselves in the trashy television, music and pop culture of the day. We must join them in excessive drinking and partying. We must use filthy language like they do, perhaps even indulge in sexual promiscuity and relax our views on homosexuality and other sins along the way. We must do all this in order to relate to them, to show them how unlegalistic, stuffy and uptight we are, to tell them we're not crazy, fanatical weirdos like they might have thought, that we are in fact just normal like they are. The problem with this approach is that when a licentious world sees a licentious church, it thinks, you're just like I am. In other words, there's nothing different about us to let the world know we have anything worth having. In fact, all that's really happened by this method is we've embraced the law of Satan ourselves, rejected the voice of the Spirit, and instead of the church evangelizing the world, the world has evangelized us. We've filled our minds with the philosophies and cultural memes of the day. We've started to think, talk and act like the world. And though we claim to be different and to believe in something, our actions say otherwise. The world is not fooled. It rejects God on the basis that we don't really believe in him ourselves. If we turn to Hosea, we can read about a time when God's representatives on earth became licentious. God spoke saying, There is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. You curse and lie and kill and steal and commit adultery. There is violence everywhere, with one murder after another. That is why your land is not producing. It is filled with sadness and all living things are becoming sick and dying. Even the animals, birds and fish have begun to disappear. Don't point your finger and try to pass the blame. Look, you priests, my complaint is with you. My people are being destroyed because they don't know me. It's all your fault, you priests, for you yourselves refuse to know me. Like priests, like people. Since the priests are wicked, the people are wicked too. In other words, the people don't know about me because you priests aren't telling them about me. And what's worse, you're just as bad as they are. Now, under the new covenant, there is no longer a professional priestly class and instead, all Christians are now considered priests in the sense that we're all equally responsible purveyors of Christ's message. You may have heard the phrase, the priesthood of all believers. 
which means to make that passage relevant to today, we can reread it by replacing the word priests with Christians. There is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. You curse and lie and kill and steal and commit adultery. There is violence everywhere with one murder after another. That is why your land is not producing. It is filled with sadness and all living things are becoming sick and dying. Even the animals, birds and fish have begun to disappear. Don't point your finger and try to pass the blame. Look you Christians, my complaint is with you. These people are being destroyed because they don't know me. It is all your fault you Christians, for you yourselves refuse to know me. Like Christians, like people. Since the Christians are wicked, the people are wicked too. God is having a go at his own people here and saying, Why aren't you taking your responsibility seriously? Why aren't you being salt and light? We don't change the world by becoming like the world. We're called to be world changers, not world chasers. What we should basically realise is that both legalism and licence are completely useless in trying to reach the world. If the church is legalistic, the world is repelled by the lack of warmth and genuine love. No one likes a Pharisee. But if the church is licentious, the world is unmoved by the lack of genuine, life-changing holiness. The quandary for the church then has always been, how can we be both loving and holy at the same time? The solution, of course, is to offer the true, uncompromising gospel. Remember how holiness and love met at the cross. Remember how the cross told us that God is so uncompromisingly holy that all sin must be punished with death and yet also told us that he is so uncompromisingly loving that he would rather die in our place than let us be lost. Well, just as uncompromising holiness and love met in the cross of Christ, so uncompromising holiness and love must meet in us, the ecclesia, the church. We tend to fall into one of the two pits here and overemphasize God's holiness to the expense of his love or vice versa. In doing so, we create a false god who is either a cold tyrant or a liberal hippie. Both are idols, and whichever one we prefer is more a reflection of us than of God. It was the combination of both holiness and love that changed the world at Calvary, and it's the same potent combination that will change the world today. The world desperately needs Christians to get their act together on this, and until we do, we're going to find evangelism a frustrating endeavour, and moral entropy is going to increase. When we put holiness and love together, however, it is an infectious and powerful combination. If the world can see a people who are uncompromising on moral issues and who will defend the truth at all costs, even if such a defence means personal persecution, scorn and loss of reputation, well, they might not believe what we believe yet, but they will at least be able to see that we really, truly believe it. And in this age of relativism, that kind of integrity will grab attention. It might even win their respect and trust. One reason we can say for certain that the biblical eyewitness records of the resurrection are correct is because the people who wrote them prefer to suffer and die rather than renounce what they'd seen. The world needs to see that same unwavering devotion to holiness and truth in us. And what's more, if they can see that your integrity is married with a deep and deepening love for others that drives you towards selfless acts of authentic, spontaneous and extravagant love, the effect is atomic in scale. Even hardened atheists who would argue for hours about points of theological doctrine and scientific nuance are forced to close their mouths when they see a Christian feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, helping the poor and generally putting their faith into action. The famous atheist Christopher Hitchens wrote a book called God is not great, how religion poisons everything. That title would become demonstrably absurd in an instant if communities were flooded with Christians pouring out compassion to the sick and the hurting. It's impossible to argue against that kind of selfless love and it can't be explained away because it's just so countercultural. In fact, it is exactly because the culture is getting so dark that Christian light can become so accentuated by comparison. When people see it in action, it surprises and even shocks. It simply demands attention in a world where people are becoming increasingly selfish and egocentric. Let's grasp the opportunity that the encroaching darkness affords us. Do you class yourself as a liberal? If you're liberal with holiness, then you're going to end up in terrible sin and immorality. 
Do you class yourself as conservative? If you're conservative with love, then you're going to become Pharisaic. Be conservative with holiness, but be liberal with love. Let's go between the two pits of legalism and license and use our freedom in Christ to change the world.